So, uh, hi to all of you guys. First of all, I would like to know who already is familiar with uh, DC, Dining Crypto Girls. Okay, a few of you. Um, today I'm going to talk about a technical solution uh, against data retention. Um, I will put an emphasis on the current uh, anonymization technologies and uh, which problems they bear inside. And then I will uh, introduce you the dining cryptographers technology or the idea behind it. Um, and then uh, tell you also about some advanced mechanisms behind this idea. And then I will speak about the uh, implementations with, uh, which I did in, within the last uh, 10 months or so uh, during my diploma thesis. And of course, also, I, I have an agenda, sorry. Uh, and of course, I will give an outlook, which is possible, how should the future look like, and then uh, we have plenty of time for questions. So I hope you brought some, or then you will have some. So what is the current approach of anonymization technologies? Um, if people are speaking about anonymization, it's most of the time mixed networks or mixed cascades. And the two most uh, famous representatives are Tor, Onion Router, and Yap. And it, they work as follows, more or less the same principle. There is a network or a compound of, of mixes, yeah, so-called mixes, and um, a sender can construct uh, envelope channels, uh, encrypted channels through these mixes to uh, hide the, the fact who is communicating with whom. And if there are different sender, a second, for example, does the same, then from outside it will uh, become very difficult to find out uh, who is who's communicating uh, with whom. Um, so I guess everybody of you will already know about this uh, idea. So um, what problems do we have? I will first start off with the, with the weakest problem. Um, compared to DC networks, uh, we have weak encryption as it's only computation theoretically secure. Um, so a strong attacker might be able to break uh, the encrypted channels and then unveil the identities of the users. Um, this is not a current problem, but if we keep using uh, stronger and stronger computers, uh, this might become a problem very soon. But for the time being, it's good enough. And to be honest, I'm also using uh, computationally secure keys only. It's just that DC offers the possibility to have uh, better keys. Um, the second problem that I would like to mention is the unknown anonymity set. Um, so if you, if you speak about anonymity, it's about hiding identities. And um, so sometimes it can be a little bit complicated to, to or it can seem a bit strange to um, think about knowing the other uh, participants of the identity set uh, would be a good idea. But um, I think if you, want to, uh, if you want to keep your anonymity in a good quality, you have to know your anonymity set. So you also have to know uh, who other participants or who other users, which other users are using uh, the anonymization technologies. Because um, if you don't know them, if you don't know the exact anonymity set, uh, intersection attacks can be very easy. So if you have a strong attacker who can measure who is using uh, an anonymity service or not, uh, he, and then is regarding the traffic over the anonymity set, and then he can maybe detect uh, on Tuesdays um, there are two guys speaking about one subject, and on Wednesday there's only one of them speaking, uh, uh, and, and this kind of subject appears, so it's probably one of them. Or it's, it's probably the, the, the guy that speaks on Wednesday. So uh, this is the intersection attack, and this is possible if you don't know uh, the anonymity set. So, um, And now I come to the biggest problem. Um, the trust relies in the mixes. So normally you ha have a pass through three mixes. 
and um, you have to trust at least uh, one of them. Um, um, the, in general, the anonymity can be unveiled either if all the um, other users are other users of the anonymity servers work together, or if all the mixes work together. Now the question is: Are um, the mixes trustworthy? And this is a point where I beg to be, where I beg to defer, because um, what is if we have something like a malicious Tor service net? Tor service net is an organization who put a lot of money and effort into uh, building up Tor servers. It's a it's a great idea and a great organization. I support them because what they do, I think they are trustworthy because I know them. Yeah, but. Um, what they do is they mark their servers as as a family, so they stay. Uh, the the people can choose a pass through different families of of mix uh, compounds. So, um, but what if an attacker put a lot of money uh, in setting up Tor nodes without uh, marking them as one family? Then the probability would be very uh, high to have a path through untrustworthy nodes. Another problem that we also face probably uh, in Germany also with our next parliament um, is data retention law. So if a law would enforce the operators of uh, anonymity services to open up all the connections, uh, the, all the mixing tech, uh, techniques um, that they are doing, then the anonymity would be easily unveiled as well, you can see on this picture. Most of the, this d depicts the Tor nodes and uh, about half of the Tor nodes is located, are located in, in Europe. So um, if we have a European data retention law that would enforce the operators to open up all the mixings that they are doing uh, would have a big problem for the Tor service. So now I would like to come to the DC part of uh, this talk, the dining cryptographers, um, which can be seen as a technical solution to data retention because data retention cannot attack uh, yeah, the anonymity. Uh, in DC networks, um, officially the DC networks are invented by uh, David Chaum in 1988, uh, 88, and it stands for Dining Cryptographers, but uh, by random it's the initials of his name. Um, and it's a round-based uh, message exchange principle where all the participants take part in one round to exact to exchange exactly one message. So to make it even more clear, um, during one round, one participant can say change, exchange um, or send a message, and all the other uh, participants that are using the service at the same time help him to anonymize the sending process. And um, the, uh, the idea behind DC networks um, offers sender and recipient anonymity. So how do we achieve sender anonymity? First of all, the participants uh, would have to exchange keys among each other. Okay, I have the car. Okay. So um, first, the participant would have uh, to exchange keys among each other, and um, the more keys uh, are exchanged, the better it is because uh, the anonymity set equals the trust uh, the trustworthy participants that share um, one key graph. So um, even if you don't know all of the other participants, maybe the probability, or not maybe, but the probability is high that there are many trustworthy uh, other participants using the service, and it doesn't cost you anything to exchange keys. So, um, and if you want to do a, a, a DC round, um, you have to use a new key each round. So what people do normally is they exchange key generators instead of keys, um, and there they can use uh, real random or uh, pseudo random bit streams. Of course, if you have real random bit streams, um, then you have very strong uh, anonymity. If you pseudo bit stream run, uh, yeah, pseudo random bit streams, then you will face the same problem that it's computationally attackable. 
So uh, to display, uh, to to give you an example how uh, DC round could could work, you can here you see three participants: P1, P2, and P3. And um, P1 is pink because he is allowed to send this round. You can see it by indicated by the M1. It's the message one, which is five. So he wants to uh, submit a five in this round, and he has exchanged a key with participant number two, which is one, and he has exchanged a key with participant number th three, which is three. And at the same uh, same time, you can look at participant number two. He um, doesn't send a, r a message this round because it's number one's uh, uh, turn to send. And the, queue, uh, the key that he uses with uh, participant number one is the inverse of uh, the key that sh uh, they exchanged. And there's an algorithm to uh, find out which one of the participant uh, uses the inverse and which one uses the normal key. And the same uh, for participant number three. So what they do is they uh, add up a local sum. Yeah, um, it's normal adding five plus uh, one plus three is equals nine, and the others do seven and negative eleven. And these local sums um, are transferred to the DC service. Um, this is what can be observed by the data retention, but there is nothing because they, these, key, uh, these messages, these local sums are like uh, one-time pads. Um, there is nothing that is, is uh, worthy to be observed. And the local DC, so, uh, the DC service da, um, takes local sums and ups, adds them up to a global sum, and what comes out is the message that participant number one um, intended to send. To have recipient anonymity, um, the next step would be uh, for the DC service to broadcast this message, this global sum, back to the participants. This way, um, the probability that the message is des destined for one of the uh, three participants is equal, so it's uh, perfect. Um, so I'll explain to you the sender and recipient anonymity of normal DC. Um, but what I said is, like, a participant can exchange, uh, ex or change only one message and the other participants have to uh, send zero or the neutral element. So what we also need to, uh, to do is to find out which participant is allowed to send in which round. And therefore you need a reservation phase or a, res a reservation. And a uh, sequence of rounds which is defined by the reservation phase and the sending phase, which are both anonymous, are defined as work cycles in the DC terminology. Um, how does a reservation work? There are different methods to do a reservation. Um, the one I chose in my implementation is called coll collusion resolution method. Um, yeah, as I already stated, it's anonymous and it's uh, done as such that you have uh, specially formatted DC messages and you send them to, to the DC service and observe the result and um, by doing that several times in a row you can find out when is your turn to send. It takes a deterministic amount of rounds for a certain number of participants to find out the order of sending process. Um, but are we safe now? No, uh, not really. If you're only a passive attacker, then you can gain no special information um, by just observing the local or global sums. But if you are an active attacker, um, you can attack the anonymity by delaying or modifying the broadcast. So I will give you an example. Um, the evil DC networks now uh, would broadcast the global sum A to participant one and participant three, but uh, A prime to participant number two. And they, like this, ooh, animation, and in uh, round N. And if the evil DC networks observes um, an answer, A prime prime, to the global sum A prime um, in one of the following rounds, it can only be from participant number two, because all the other participants uh, did not receive A prime, but only A. 
So um, the Evil DC network would know that uh, participant number two was the original or was the uh, real recipient for this message. And he also knows that the reply is a prime prime. Um, so what is the solution to this problem? Um, the solution is to take uh, the old messages, the old global sums that each participant uh, receives into account when generating new keys. There are two ideas to do this. Um, there is this uh, deterministic fail stop, which takes all the old uh, history, all the history of uh, received messages into account. And then there is also a probabilistic fail stop, which only takes into account the last message and the last key used. I'll give you uh, an example how it uh, could work. So a key, this is probabilistic fast up. A key to the time uh, for the round number T between uh, participant I and J would consist of a um, random number for or the, the random key for the time T and also another random number for the time uh, uh, T, which is B. And um, the key from the old round plus E, which is a, it's a secret exchange constant, it doesn't change, and I is the, the message character, the global sum, which was received in the, uh, in the round that just happened before. Um, fail stop keys um, would have unequally distrib uh, distributed global sums in, uh, into causing result, uh, into, um, so unequally distributed global sums would cause junk on the, S on, on the global sums. Um, so the attack on the anonymity uh, can be detected by, because if you do not observe the, your message on the network, then uh, you know that somebody attacked uh, or try, maybe try to attack the anonymity and uh, yeah, you can react somehow and the anonymity re itself remains. The uh, bad side is that the service becomes unavailable because if there is one junk on the global sum, it will propagate into the following sum. So you also need to think about if you design such a protocol, how to resync or how to get the service res restarted. Um, yeah, the other attack which can be uh, next to an attacks on anonymity is the attack on availability. We have already seen that the anonymity is very strong within the DC networks, but the availability is quite weak on DC networks. So. Um, not only that we use a lot of bandwidth to exchange just one message, but the participants can send when they are normally not allowed. And as I just st stated, this will cause uh, junk in the global sums. And if we have normal DC um, keys, like in the animation that you just saw, um, then just one round is disturbed. But uh, if you use those advanced key generation mechanisms, um, the following rounds will be disturbed as well. Mm, there are, in theory, already algorithms to unveil the attacker step by step um, and to exclude him. But therefore, you need an extra network in parallel uh, with the feature to be highly available. And um, the other uh, bad thing is that transmission errors have the same appearance uh, as attacks on availability. But there the countermeasurement is just to sign the messages so you can uh, detect whether somebody transmitted junk on purpose or whether it was just a transmission error. So to recap the, the introduction of uh, DC networks, um, DC is a Technology which offers very defined anonymity. Uh, the anonymity that does not rely on trust in the service itself. Um, it can provide information theoretical anonymity if you use uh, those real uh, 
real random uh, keys. And the attacks on integrity and confidentiality are easily detectable. Of course, I uh, have to mention the cons. It sc scales with difficulties and uh, the availability is easily attackable. But, I mean, if you want to have anonymous communication, sometimes the availability can be put behind the, the quality of an uh, anonymity. So, now the protocol and the implementations. Um, in my diploma thesis, I uh, designed a protocol which defines a reservation and uh, sending phase. Um, it allows the participants to join and to leave uh, the service dynamically. So uh, all the papers um, think about permanent participants, but in real uh, reality, participants want to go offline and drive through a tunnel, so you have to think about how to do that. And uh, it allows variable message lengths, so people can decide, I want to send uh, two characters or three message characters and so on. And it's designed to be very low overhead as the, the method itself already consumes a lot of bandwidth. Secondly, the protocols allows on-the-fly key exchange, of course, then the keys are uh, pseudo random bit streams and um, they are digitally signed so you can verify other participants' identities so you can um, consider for yourself other people as trustworthy or not by uh, telling the different uh, signatures apart. And um, the protocol is open for key different key generation methods so for example the three of those which I already presented to you. The protocol as well resyncs on attack, um, on the availability, so if somebody is disturbing um, the communication, as we already saw, the protocol is already, uh, automatically resyncing and uh, also does it as well if um, advanced key generation methods are used. The flaws of the protocol are that a determination of the attacker is not yet possible as there is no management network available and it's yet based on a central DC service. What I did as well is uh, an yeah, real time, not real time, but it's an implementation in, in, in Java. It's a library which implements the presented protocol as a service and as well the participants. And um, it automatically maximizes the key exchange graph so you will be as anonymous as you can be within the set of anonymity of the participants and it offers a nice API so even if you don't really understand everything uh, what I just said you could use it and uh, provide some anonymous communication for your applications. Um, it provides normal key generation as well as these fail stop uh, mechanisms, but it's also open to new uh, to new key generation algorithms, and it's they are quite easily pluggable. Um, if the DC if DC minus minus it's the name of the implementation um, sees errors on the within the communication, it retries automatically to, to resend. So that's also nothing that you have to keep track of. And also here there is no extra management network, so also here the unveiling of the attacker is not possible yet. I also did some other implementations, which is Erlang DC. It's the same, but in Erlang, as I'm a big fan of Erlang, and uh, it's uh, maybe less scientific and more hackable and more suited for this kind of problem. And what I also did is a multicast library which adds up a 
multicast layer above this DC communication because often um, the participants are not interested in all the global sums but only in a few. So they can pick up a multicast channel and then only re receive those messages for this channel. It's transparent. What I also did were some measurements. Um, I measured it within the Planet Lab. The Planet Lab is a compound of scientific organizations. Um, they put up computers in the internet and it's more a study than a laboratory measurement as I use the real internet. And um, I have only little influence on the participants as they are all doing other tasks as well. And the only attention I paid to were choosing the participants locally so the latency would be minimized. And now the big surprise, if you have uh, 10 participants with um, fully exchanged key graph, um, one kilobyte message length, you have about one kilobyte um, per second per participant, which is not too much. And, but you have to compare what what does it mean? If you trust those 10 participants as you would trust the mixes that you use in Tor, this means that you take a, a route through 10 Tor mixes. So it's the same quality of anonymity. And uh, of course, if you take this deterministic probability, uh, deterministic phase stop key generation uh, mechanism, which takes into account all the message history, you, ha you end up by two bytes per second per participant, which is, of course, not very good. And the other algorithms are within the same magnitude. And I found out that it's not a bandwidth problem, but a problem of uh, advanced key generation method. And DC uh, networks are synchronous, so it depends on the support of every participant. And in general, the um, participant need about 40% of a round time for key generation. But uh, the slowest participant always needed around about 80% of the round time. So uh, they were very, very slow. So the idea now to uh, counter this, um, this problem would be um, to install hierarchical DC networks where you have uh, a very low quality DC network where the people could participate and after a certain amount of time if they prove that they can uh, send the message fastly enough they could um, s step one level up to a DC network of a better quality where they would do um, quality contact contracts regarding the, the speed in which they send. Of course, um, I didn't mention it in the, in the slides, but the, the protocol also supports timeouts. So um, you can also define a timeout. Um, and after, if the participants do not send within the timeout, they get kicked, kicked out and, and uh, the communication can continue. So uh, a little early, I come uh, to the future of uh, DC networks. Um, it's my great wish to decentralize. Um, it's um, possible, I think. Um, I have some ideas from BitTorrents in mind to uh, distribute the, the, commutation, the computation of the global sum. <clears throat> and um, what we need as well is the management network to unveil the attackers to be able to exclude them. And of course, one could play with hierarchical uh, DC networks and reputation systems to make the quality a little better. So, um, what you sh uh, should take home is um, there are other anonymity services than only mixed networks. This is one of them. Um, DC networks can offer a technical defense a day against data retention. So if a politician comes uh, and says like data retention would be the solution to every blah 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 terrorist attack and so on, 
um, you just say them uh, they would use DC networks and they they would be safe. So never mind. And uh, DC networks also, if they are not suitable for your daily communication yet, yeah, I, I want to emphasize yet. <laughs> um, they can maybe uh, be a building block within your application design or with your um, uh, protocol design. So um, you have something that which offers a high and deterministic degree of anonymity. And I think I'm already done a little early. Sorry for that. Uh, so now I'm open for questions. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was really good. And if you have questions, just raise your hand and I will get around to you. <coughs> uh, uh, sorry, something that I wanted to, uh, to say before the question. Maybe I think she, here the, this one was the first one, no? No. Okay, so if you are interested in this research topic, um, or in anonymity in general, please uh, contact me and help me to, to develop this, uh, this method and this idea. That would be great. Okay, now to the first question. Um, could you uh, go into some detail on, the, on how you uh, detect attackers through the management, uh, through the, um, the management network th and uh, why an attacker wouldn't be able to out the identity of another anonymous participant with uh, with this technique, I didn't get the um, question. One hundred percent. Oh, the, the um, so if you have a if you have a malicious participant, uh, an attacker who's injecting noise into the system. Yes. Uh, the, there's a management network. Yes. That allows you to reveal only the malicious participant. Um, how exactly does that work? Okay. The idea behind this. Um, Normally, there is there is nothing on the net management network. You would only use it in in, uh, in times of of trouble. Yeah. So um, if you observe some some noise, some junk on the global sums, people start to you send uh, traps, trap messages, which are not really uh, confidential. But uh, as the attacker doesn't know when people are sending confidential network uh, messages or not. Um, it wouldn't be, uh, maybe he would attack such a trap and then it wouldn't be um, a problem to open up the, the keys for that round and by opening up all the keys uh, on, in the management network, it would be able uh, to find out who was the one that uh, betrayed the others. And um, of course, um, there can be two participants claiming, okay, I use, because it's always two participants sharing one key, right? So um, there can be two participants saying, okay, I use key A, and the other one is said, yeah, but we, we said to use key B, um, and the others cannot know. So what, what they do is just that they stop exchanging keys. And by, um, then they would continue to, to communicate. And if you observe global sums, junk in the global sums again, then again you would try to, to open up the keys uh, on a trap message, and then there's again uh, this probably the attacker and another participant, and um, there would also be key A and key B. So, and over the time, the attacker would uh, would um, stop exchanging keys with all the participants, so he would result alone and had no more influence. So that's that's the. Did you get it, more or less? Okay, no problem. Next question, please. One question from, I One question from IRC. Um, how, does it, how well does it scale? Have you tried with a couple of hundreds participants? Um, well, I scaled up to uh, 30 participants. And it became very, I mean, it still worked, but it became very slow. So that, uh, in, I think to, to, to perform 70 work cycles, I needed 14 hours uh, with uh, 
the probabilistic key exchange um, uh, a key generation method. So it's not good enough yet. Um, okay, uh, the way I understood um, you, uh, I'm here. <laughs> um, uh, the more people you have uh, participating in, in message exchanging, the lower the bandwidth per person gets. Is that correct? Like the more people you have yes. participate, yes. Um, but as you already hinted, you you, you mentioned multicast. Um, this this disadvantage partly disappears if you have one too many communications. I right? didn't get the last part. Um, like part of this um, deficit disappears if you have one too many. Uh, communications. So, if you have some some, some sort of broadcast or yeah, yes. multicast, is said. So, actually, wouldn't it be very interesting to use this for um, stuff like you know Twitter or um, um, radio, video broadcasting, that kind of thing? Have you put any thought into that? Um, yes, um, of course. Twitter is the first thing that comes into your one's mind if uh, if you are designing such a uh, such a example program, for example. So yes, that would be, um, Twitter is a very good application. Another good application would be anonymous, anonymous distribution of, of files, like exchange, peer-to-peer peer -peer exchange. So, but therefore it would be even nicer to, to decentralize and to remove the central base. But yes, you're, you're right. Uh, when you have the um, different clients connecting to a DC network and using it like a substitute for Tor or Yap, and you have like um, the nodes which are providing um, the, the entry nodes, and you have like clients using it, and you're not, nothing doing to uh, protect their, their IPs because um, every client has to, has to exchange keys with every other peer. So um, I know all IPs of all peers within the network, so um, I, I can tell if a client is, is using it and, and then blocking them w w uh, as an, as an, as an um, evil attacker. So. Okay, as I already stated, the, the service is yet central, centralized, and the key exchange itself also goes over the server. So the participants, pa participants do not see each other's IP addresses, but only the key IDs. Um, and they are relayed of the service. But the service itself can, of course, uh, see all the participants uh, using it. And if there are um, governance that want to block a, a certain service and you only have one uh, central DC server, then they block it and then it's gone, yeah. It's, but that's an availability problem. Okay. Over there. Oh, okay, the next question over here. Okay, in one slide you have shown P1 to P3, where P1 was sending uh, the number five. Yes. And uh, he has only got uh, positive numbers, uh, and the other ones had the opposite. So the question is, if he's only allowed to generate positive uh, key numbers, then the person with the highest uh, sum is the sender. No, um, that was just uh, um, the example for, um, yeah. This one. So uh, here you have the the nine, the seven, and the negative eleven. Only one participant has uh, a negative uh, local sum, and this is just to make it easy for you to understand. Normally, everybody would just sum up, and then um, before hands calculate the the key a little bit different, and uh, use modulo something. So there is I only use positive integers. Given a limited bandwidth, how many users could you accommodate in one network? Um, as I stated already, at the moment, the, um, the problem is not the bandwidth, it's the key generation time. So 80% of a round duration is taken by the slowest participant to generate the keys. And that's the biggest problem. So I, I also have to improve the key generation, maybe do it in C and not uh, those slow programming languages. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering, you mentioned that there is an attack on the availability which slightly looks like an error in the package. And your solution or your suggested solution was to use signature on it. But as far as I understand, the signature that would actually fairly reduce your degree of anonymity within the network. 
so how would you sign the, how, what would you suggest as a signature algorithm uh, that won't reduce the anonymity? Um. So what, what you already is assigned is, are the keys. So the users of the service are itself um, um, are known, yeah, or are considered to be known. Um, this is the advantage also in my, in my eyes. Um, if they use the same key to, to sign the, glo uh, the local sums, um, you can see what uh, an attacker from outside could also see which uh, sender or which participant would transfer which local sum. There is no additional information. It's just cryptographically verified that, can, could not, that there is no external attacker uh, in between the line modifying the, the data. So that's was it good enough, the, the answer, or maybe I didn't get your question right? Fairly about it, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience? If not, I want to thank you all for the patience and <coughs> want to thank Klops for the really good presentation and give a big round of applause for him. Thank you very much.